Hey there, STAT students. We are in our final unit. We are in chapter 12. Now, this chapter is very similar to chapter three that we did uh, last semester, but it's also combining some of the concepts that we've been talking about in this semester, such as confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. <coughs> to prepare us for this chapter, you have or had a um, review to do. Uh, the context had to do with um, where you sit in class and if that relates to how well you do on a test. So you see you have the computer output for the data uh, and you also have a scatter plot of the data and you had to go through and you had to answer questions like what were the explanatory and response variables? You had to use the computer output to determine the least squares regression line. Uh, if you needed help on that, if you turn to page 182 in your book, that can help you out. You had to do things like calculate R, uh, which is the correlation coefficient. Calculate and interpret residuals, interpret slope, interpret standard deviation of residuals. These are all things we have done in the past. Uh, and we are going to go over this together, either in a video or in person. So answer those on best you can and then see how you did a little later. This chapter is all about inference for linear regression. So here are the main goals for this first section. By the end of this section, uh, there should be maybe two or three videos. You're going to be able to check the conditions for performing inference about the slope, that's a beta, of the population regression line. So we've been checking conditions for a while now, but there's going to be new ones and different ones for slope. We're going to construct and interpret confidence intervals for slope. Uh, we're going to be able to perform significance tests about slope, and then also interpret computer output, which is something we've been doing for a while. And as just say for a while, we did it back in chapter three. So when a scatter plot shows a linear relationship between a quantitative explanatory variable X and a quantitative response variable Y, we can use the least squares line fitted to the data to predict Y for a given value of X. Now, if the data are a random sample from a larger population, we're gonna need statistical inference to answer questions like these. Is there really a linear relationship between X and Y in the population? Or could the pattern we see plausibly just have happened by chance alone? Also in the population, how much will the predicted value of Y change for each increase of one unit in X? What's the margin of error for this estimate? So these are some questions we're gonna to need to be able to answer. So quick review. This is our general form of linear regression equation. Uh, back when you were young little mathematicians, you learned y equals mx plus b. As a statistician, you learned y hat equals a plus bx, uh, where y hat is the predicted dependent variable um, or your response variable. A was your y-intercept, b was your slope, and x was your independent variable, also sometimes called the explanatory variable. Now, this is what happens and what is um, basically our estimate regression line. Um, it's a sample regression line. The population regression line is similar, but it's gonna use Greek letters as opposed to A and B. It uses alpha and beta in place of A and B. It's still Y hat though. Let's just do a quick review. Um, and if you got stuck doing that 12.1 review before you got started. This might be will um, jog your memory a bit. When you're looking at computer output, the number that is next to constant and coefficient, that is the y-intercept. And the number beneath that is gonna be your slope. Um, next to it over here is basically what the context is. So this one was about change of something. Um, other important values, this S right here is the standard deviation of the residual. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to call that also the standard error. And then you have your R squared value here. Eventually, we're going to learn about what the number next to the slope means, to so the right of it. And then you'll notice that there's T and P, 
We'll also look at that later as well. Um, spoiler alert, the P has to do with P value. So let's just do some recalling, remembering, reviewing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the context here, this data came from a study about toddler calorie consumption and time spent eating at the table. Uh, we want to interpret three different things. We want to interpret S, we want to interpret R squared, and the standard error of the slope. So let's just start, what is S? Okay. Um, S here is 23.4-ish, okay? Uh, R squared is 42.1%. Standard error of the slope um, is actually this value right here, um, 0.8498. So here's how that would work out. So to interpret the standard deviation, the typical error when using the regression line to predict calorie consumption is about 23.4 calories on average, okay? R squared tells you your um, coefficient of determination. So approximately 42.1% of the variation in our calorie consumption can be explained by the linear relationship with the time spent at the table. Uh, the rest of it is explained by other unknown factors. Now, standard error of the slope. If, slopes, or excuse me, if samples like this were observed many times, the typical distance that the estimated slope would differ from the population slope um, would be about an average of 0.8498. That one's a little bit newer, and we'll talk more about that in this unit. Another example, uh, the context here. Students randomly assigned 14 helicopters to um, one of five different drop heights. Teams of students released the 70 helicopters in a predetermined random order and measured the flight times. We want to uh, identify first what the least squares regression line is, um, interpret the slope, and also interpret S. So our S is right there. These two values that are in yellow help you find your slope and your y-intercept. Um, notice how I didn't use x and y, I used um, hat of flight time and drop height. It's easier to use the actual variable name so you can not get confused about what is what as far as X and Y is concerned. From there, you can see the drop height is next to its slope and the value above that is where the Y intercept came from. If we want to interpret, the slope was 0 0.0057, right? We saw that right there. So on average, the flight time increased by about 0 0.005 seconds for each additional centimeter of drop height. So as X changes, how does Y change? Um, interpreting S here, which was 0.168 seconds, if you saw that right here. Uh, this is the size of a typical prediction error if we were to use the least squares regression line to predict the flight time of a helicopter from its drop height. So remember, standard deviation tells you always how far you are from what you think it should be, uh, whether it be mean or in this case, the predicted value and the actual value. So let's get into a little bit of theory here. The least squares regression line for this population of data has been added to the graph. Okay. Um, it has a slope of 10.36 and a y-intercept of 33.97. This is going to be called a population regression line, or it can be called a true regression line because it uses all of the observations that month. Suppose we were to take a simple random sample of 20 eruptions um, from the least squares regression line, y hat equals a plus bx for the sample data. I'm pretty sure this data, I don't have the context there, but I'm almost positive it has to do with um, oh, what's it called? That geyser, that famous geyser, Old Faithful. Um, the length of its duration and then like how long or the interval between. How is our slope going to relate? Well, you can notice if the true value was 10.36 and also 33.97, our slopes are different as are our y intercepts, okay? They vary quite a bit. This is gonna happen when you do samples, okay? 
this is what happens when you have samples. The pattern of variation is described by its sampling distribution. We have sampling distributions for slope, just like we did for means and proportions. Now, confidence intervals and significance tests about the slope of the population regression line are based on the sampling distribution of B, which is the slope of the sample regression. Okay? A couple different things. The uh, shape it's going to be roughly symmetric, hopefully unimodal. Uh, a normal probability plot of these sample regression line slopes suggests that it's approximately normal. The center is going to be um, what the true slope is. And then the spread, uh, we will see later how that works out. So the sampling distribution of B, remember B is slope. The sampling distribution is going to be the possible values of B that could occur by chance in random sampling or random assignment when your null is true. Okay. The shape is going to be approximately normal, as again, as long as certain conditions are met. The center is going to be beta, which is the true slope. And then our formula for spread, my standard error, is this guy right here, which is on your formula sheet. Once we know the sampling distribution of B, of our slope, we can use it to calculate p-values and also to create confidence intervals. Now, I want us to take a look at our conditions. Y'all, there are quite a few. Before, we usually had three. We always looked at random, normal, and independent. Uh, for chi-square test, it was random, independent, and then large counts. When we're checking conditions for uh, regression, we're going to use the acronym LINER to help us remember. So independent still there, normal still there, random still there. Linear and equal variance are the new ones. Now for linear, you need to look at the scatter plot. Okay, you need to look at the scatter plot to make sure that it actually does look kind of like a line. Also, if you happen to have the residual plot, you want to make sure that um, it's you know, there's no patterns, um, that it's, you know, kind of like the night sky and it's all like evenly distributed throughout. Independent, uh, if it was from sampling, you check the 10% condition. Otherwise, if it was an uh, experiment, you look for random assignment. Normal, we have to look at the residuals here, not the data, but the residuals. Make sure it doesn't look like there's any skew um, or outliers or things like that. You can do a histogram, you can do a pro um, normal probability plot whichever. Equal variance, you're going to look at the scatter of the residuals again above and below. You want to make sure the amount of scatter is about the same. All right, so roughly scattered about the same and we'll see what this looks like. And then random, obviously either it came from a random sample or from a randomized experiment. In the next video, you're actually going to take the data from that review worksheet that you did about where you sit uh, in relation to your score on a test. And we're going to go through and write out what the different conditions are and how they have been met for each one of these. If you don't have your calculator out already, you're going to want to put your calculator out. And we will go through all five of these in the next video.